Hello friends, I am Dr. Ajay Adav. So let's discuss uh, uh, some high yield questions for your next NEET or uh, uh, 2023 exam. So question number one, after how much time a patient can be positive for elective surgery after undergoing drug eluded stents? Any time, any time but with high risk after three months, after six months. You know that when the patient has MI, the chances of reinfarction is very high if the patient or a person is subjected to any kind of a stress. So surgery and anesthesia is a big stress. So the chances of reinfarction get significantly increased means if you just consider first month, the chances of reinfarction can be as high as 30 to 40 percent. So therefore, we have to defer elective surgery for a certain period of time uh, <coughs> to prevent this re-MI. Now, how much time a surgery should be deferred after an MI depends how MI was managed. So, there are three ways to manage uh, MI. One may be conservatively. Second, MI would have been managed by stenting. Stenting again may be bare metal stent. Or drug eluded stent, and third method of managing MI is bypass surgery. So, if MI was managed conservatively, elective surgery should be deferred for two months. And wherever I am using green pen in my presentation. That means that is a change from the existing or you can say that is a recent update. So previously we were deferring elective surgery for six weeks if MI was managed conservatively. But now they say two months. If MI was managed with bare metal stent then we have to defer elective surgery for one month. And why again I use green pen? because previously recommendation was six weeks but nowadays hardly anybody is using bare metal stent so mostly they are using drug eluded stents and if patient was managed with drug eluding stents then we have to defer elective surgery for six months and why green pen because in books you may find answer given is one year and that was true because uh, previously the stent which were used were <coughs> used to get completely epithelized in one year. So we have to defer elective surgery for one year. And why in fact if the patient has undergone drug loaded stent why we have to defer elective surgery for six months or one year? Because these patients are on dual antiplatelet and we cannot afford to stop antiplatelet. After six months, these newer stents, they undergo complete epithelization and you can afford to stop at least one of the antiplatelet. So, clopidogrel we stop, but aspirin we continue. And if the patient was managed with bypass surgery, then recommendation previously was also six weeks and now also is six weeks. So, I am not changing the pan. So if MI was managed conservatively, we have to defer elective surgery for two months. If managed with bare metal stent, we have to defer elective surgery for one month. If managed with drug eluded stents, it has to be uh, deferred for six months. And if with surgery, then we have to defer surgery, uh, elective surgery for six weeks. So now we can look at the question. After drug eluding stents, six months. So means answer is D. Question number two, monitoring of which ECG lead is most important in intraoperative period for an MI patient undergoing hysterectomy. Lead 1, lead 2, lead V3, lead V5. Now again I am changing the pan because until recently we believe that the best lead for detecting MI used to be lead V5 but recent evidence have found that V3 or V4 are even better than V5 in detecting majority of MIs. So this is a major change. 
so nowadays we prefer v3 or even v4 over v5 so that's again a very important change because for decades and decades we were monitoring lead v5 but now they say v3 or v4 are preferred over v5 so that again makes it very important from a recent advancement point of view so the best lead would be lead v3 so see question number three anesthesia in an mi patient with normal ejection fraction is best maintained on oxygen nitroxide halothane oxygen nitroxide isofluorine oxygen nitroxide sevoflurane oxygen nitroxide desflurane this is again a very very important change okay before that two three important things i like to discuss if i ask you inhalational agent of choice for cardiac patients of course you will say isofluorine but on the other hand you will say yes isofluorine for all cardiac patient except mi because in mi isofluorine was believed to cause coronary steel and that is why isofluorine was recommended for all cardiac patient except mi but recent evidence have found that isofluorine does not cause this coronary steel so again a very important uh, recent advancement that isofluorine does not causes coronary steel so definitely you can expect a question on this because again for decades we were believing that isofluorine causes coronary steel although previously they used to say yes it produces coronary steel but that is more or less theoretical phenomena but now they say that it even doesn't cause coronary steel so now isofluorine can be used in all cardiac patients including mi while previously it was excluded from mi patients so of course anesthesia will be best maintained with oxygen nitrous oxide and isofluorine but this is a situation where ejection fraction is normal now if i say that patient ejection fraction is low say just only say 30% or 35% then now can you use inhalational agent no because all these volatile agents they decreases the cardiac output so all these inhalational agents volatile agents they decreases the cardiac output so cannot be used in a case where there is already decrease in cardiac output if cardiac output is normal means normal ejection fraction means cardiac output is normal normal ejection fraction that means lv function is normal you can say so in that case even a little decrease in cardiac output won't make much difference but if the patient is already compromised ejection fraction is already low so further decrease in ejection fraction can be really deleterious so in that case if there is low ejection fraction we cannot use inhalational agent and in place of isofluorine anesthesia will be maintained with iv opioids intravenous opioids so simple if in a mi patient if ejection fraction is normal you can safely use inhalational agent and inhalational agent of choice even for a mi patient nowadays is isofluorine but if ejection fraction is low obviously we cannot use inhalational agent so in that case anesthesia will be maintained with opioids so answer is b question number 4 which of the following medication should be stopped before elective surgery Perindopril, ibesartan, aspirin, all of the above. Okay. So just rapidly summarize that which of the drugs should actually be stopped before surgery. So drugs. To be stopped, Viagra, 
or similar drugs they should be stopped 24 hours before surgery so how many hours before surgery they have to be stopped 24 hours before surgery why because they causes uh, <coughs> sympathetic stimulation and surgery itself is a stress so there is already sympathetic elevation so further increase in sympathetic activity can precipitate even life threatening arrhythmias then oral anticoagulants particularly i will say warfarin to be stopped five days before surgery although there is another school of thought saying five, four days also so some guidelines say five days or four days then aspirin should be stopped 72 hours before surgery except, except for three situations like a recent mi recent means within two months or patient is having stent or patient has recent stroke so these are the three situations where we continue aspirin otherwise we stop aspirin 72 hours before surgery then high dose estrogen oces or otherwise patient also taking high dose estrogen should be stopped four weeks before surgery and why because estrogen increases the incidence of thromboembolism so we have to stop four weeks prior to surgery <laughs> then all antihypertensives are continued except ac inhibitors and this i'll change the pen actually so this is a new change in fact Aspirin is stopping before 72 hours nowadays is also new because maybe in some books you will find it is given that aspirin to be continued and in fact previously we were continuing aspirin now there is a recent change that they say aspirin should be stopped 3 days before then AC inhibitors AC inhibitors means uh, <coughs> captopril, phenidopril Enalapril and angiotensin receptor blockers that is valsartan, lobesartan, telmisartan, ebesartan they should be stopped 24 hours before surgery and why I use green pen because in books you will see it is given that they should be stopped on the day of surgery and that was the previous recommendation but now they say they should be stopped at least a day before surgery then other drugs which should be stopped uh, oral hypoglycemics oral hypoglycemia they are stopped on the day of the surgery they are omitted only on the day of the surgery then smoking yes Smoking should be stopped 8 weeks prior to the surgery. Why? Because smoking inhibits cilia and uh, ciliary recovery occur in 8 weeks. Then herbal medications to be stopped 7 days prior. And why I use green pan? Because uh, in books you may find it is given 2 weeks. But recent recommendation is 7 days. So these are some of the drugs which you have to stop. Then modification in regimes has to be made for cholinesterase inhibitors. Means there is dose is reduced to the minimum. Then steroids. then insulin so these are some of the drugs where we have to make some modifications so now we can look at the question which of the following should be stopped before surgery pandopril yes abisartan yes aspirin yes so answer is all of them would be 
क्वेश्चन नंबर फाइव एनेस्थीजिया ऑफ चॉइस फॉर ए पी आई एच पेशेंट अंडर गोइंग एमरजेंसी एल एस सी एस स्पाइनल एपिडोरल कंबाइंड स्पाइनल एपिडोरल जी ए अगेन अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट चेंज सो देर फोर आई चेंज द पेन नाउ एनेस्थीजिया ऑफ चॉइस फॉर पी आई एच पेशेंट इज स्पाइन अंटिल रिसेंटली वी यूज टू से एपिडोरल वाई बिकॉज PIH patient is considered as an uncontrolled hypertensive. So sudden uh, decrease in <coughs> after spinal there may occur sudden decrease in BP. So therefore they were using epidural and the reason for avoiding uh, GA in PIH patient is that there may be associated laryngeal edema and laryngeal edema is a relative contraindication for intubation. so therefore the best choice used to be epidural however actually the major disadvantage of epidural you know is that onset of epidural is very slow it take minimum 10 to 15 minutes so otherwise also it's not possible to wait for 10 to 15 minute after giving epidural secondly in this case it is emergency so just cannot wait for 15 minutes just to have onset of action so epidural is not feasible otherwise also and secondly with epidural there is patchy block so if there is a patchy block and patient start complaining of pain then you have to give ga and ga for a pregnant patient we avoid otherwise also because patient, pregnant patients are so vulnerable for aspiration that the risk of aspiration may be eight times more in a pregnant patient as compared to non pregnant patient and for ph patients i told you there is additional reason for avoiding ga that is association of laryngeal edema so because of that reasons obviously epidural is practically not given and even in my two decades of practice in fact even for ph patient i have never given epidural however theoretically it was epidural so answer used to be epidural but now theoretically you in so all books they say for pih patients you can give a spinal fine so again a very important question from your mcq point of view again a very important change because all books answer you will find is epidural but now they say is spinal which of the following is not the component of lung protective strategy for ventilation in ards Tidal volume 10 ml per kg, FiO2 80 to 100, plateau pressure 35 to 40, none of the above. Now, what is this lung protective strategy? This is very very important. And again, you can expect a question on lung protective strategy because nowadays they say it is not the mode of ventilator which you are using, it is not the cost of the ventilator which you are using, it is. not the methodology of ventilation you are using even a 1 lakh or 2 lakh ventilator or even a 20 lakh lakh ventilator you use there is no difference in outcome so the only important thing is whatever the method you are using whatever the ventilator you are using the important thing is that ventilation should be with lung protective strategy now what is my lung protective strategy the most important component of lung protective strategy is low tidal volume and by the the definition of low tidal volume will is 6 to ml per kg of ideal body weight it is not the normal body weight means for that height what should be the ideal body weight that should be used means if the patient weight is 120 that means you will not use 700 ml so what should be the ideal weight and there are formulas to calculate ideal weight then second is plateau pressure should be less than 30 cm of water plateau why we are choosing plateau pressure because plateau pressure is the pressure at the level of alveoli and barotrauma occurs because of the alveolar damage 
so we are actually concerned about the plateau pressure not the peak pressure which is the pressure of airway so plateau pressure should be less than 30 cm of water then peep that is positive and expiratory pressure and why we give peep positive and expiratory pressure so that alveoli remain open even during expiration and gas exchange can take place during expiration but the problem is all the time intrathoracic pressure is positive so there is increased risk of barotrauma so therefore they say peep should be started with minimum means start with 5 cm of water and titrate so all these strategies are to prevent barotrauma so we are protecting lung in lung protective strategy against barotrauma that's our main aim second we are protecting lung against hyperoxia so therefore FiO2 should be less than 0.6 because hyperoxia itself can cause ARDS and which is very difficult to treat so therefore they say FiO2 should be less than 60% or 0.6 even some book says or some society says that it should be less than 0.5 so now we can look at the question which of the following is not the component tidal volume 10 ml yes it is not the component it should be low tidal volume FiO2 8200 no less than 6 plateau pressure 35 to 40 no it should be less than 30 centimeter of water so none of the above is the component of lung protective strategy advantages of high flow nasal cannula are all except now as the name suggests high flow nasal cannula means it, are, it is using high flows and it can deliver as high flow as 50 to 60 liters per minute very high flow and obviously given through nasal route so high flow nasal cannula deliver very high flows 50 to 60 liter per minute to nasal cannula <laughs> now what are the advantages you are giving such high flows so that means this high flow will create some positive pressure in the airways so it provide a peep of around 4 to 6 centimeter of water so continuous high flow that will generate some kind of positive pressure so around 4 to 6 cm of positive pressure is generated by high flow nasal cannula secondly obviously needless to say gases should be humidified otherwise patient will not tolerate such high flow if the gases are not humidified so gases have to be humidified then it decreases anatomical dead space how by decreasing co2 not directly but indirectly by decreasing co2 so what are the consequence of increasing dead space co2 increases so by decreasing co2 it actually decreases the anatomical dead space or you can say it de decreases the consequence of dead space which is increase in CO2 and really this high flow nasal cannula became very popular during COVID scenario <coughs> as an alternative to intubation so it produces humidified oxygen yes it produces positive and expiratory pressure yes it increases anatomical dead space no it decreases anatomical dead space now decreases the need for intubation this is little I will say incomplete statement yes it decreases the need for intubation if you compare it with other normal oxygen delivery devices like nasal cannula oxygen mask nasal prongs it definitely decreases the need for intubation however if you compare with non-invasive ventilation means positive pressure given with the mask it really doesn't decrease the need for intubation and this is the statement which is so much used commercially by companies that it is a need for intubation so compared to normal yes oxygen delivery devices it decreases but compared to NIV I don't think it really decreases but here it 
definitely decrease anatomical dead space while this uh, statement is debatable or incomplete so of course we will go with a choice c all of the following are the advantage of the following equipment except decrease the risk of aspiration very useful for field intubation good for cervical spine fractures avoid complications of intubation what is this this is proseal lma which is second generation lma so lma was actually when manufactured there initially it was the classical lma which was manufactured this is classical lma and it was manufactured with the aim that it can be used as an alternative for failed intubation or difficult intubation so how it works you place it blindly in oral cavity so that this cuff part lies in oropharynx or hypopharynx now you inflate with large volume of air so this cuff will get inflated and we'll see in the oropharynx hypopharynx from all sides now if you ventilate through this tube you can see these holes through these holes air has no option but to go to larynx so initially when lma was manufactured it was manufactured as an alternative to failed or difficult intubation but over the years when we started to use lma we find it to be so effective method of ventilation that we started using for elective surgeries also elective ventilation initially we were using it for small duration surgeries now we are using it for even moderate or long duration surgeries in select cases because we know that it can very effectively produce ventilation but so what are the advantages technically it's easy blind procedure anybody can insert it even a paramedical staff can insert it or does it does not require laryngoscope it's a blind procedure it does not require any specific position of head and neck which you know is uh, <coughs> flexion at cervical spine and extension at atlant to occipital joint so it can be placed in any position of neck so excellent for cervical spine fractures and obviously the most important thing is it avoid complications related to intubation but nothing in the world is free of or devoid of side effects so one of the side effect or major side effect of lma is that it increase the risk of aspiration how it is not blocking the esophagus it is just resting over the esophagus so when air comes out of these uh, uh, ventilation holes majority will go to larynx but some will leak from the sides enter the esophagus increase intragastric pressure increasing the risk of aspiration and the and another problem is you cannot deflate the stomach because the cuff has occupied the oropharynx or hypopharynx so from where you will pass the suction catheter right to so you can't even deflate the stomach that was a problem with this classical uh, laryngeal mask airway however that's not a problem with the second generation lma like proseal why you can see they have given a separate tube for stomach decompression this tube you can pass your rice tube or suction catheter through this tube and through this tube through this hole it will enter the esophagus and you can deflate the stomach but definitely air can leak from the sides so the risk of aspiration is increased so a lma increases the risk of aspiration not decreases identify classical laryngeal mask airway igl supreme laryngeal mask airway proceed this is proceed we already discussed lma supreme is like that the only thing is there is a very definite bite block here and the like it is straight while lm is supreme you will find that it is angulated so angulation makes insertion insertion to become comparatively easy so this is what this is igl it's not classical lm so this is classical lm supreme i told you is an lma with curved it's like proseal and proseal we have seen it's igel and as the name suggests igel means the cuff is pre filled with a gel 
so all cuff related complications like say if this cuff get deflated by chance if this cuff get deflated lma can displace can even cause obstruction of airway and can even when touches the larynx and cause laryngospasm and when you are removing it patient may bite this cuff damaging this cuff so all these cuff related problems can be avoided with IVM. and since it is a kind of second generation however we don't say it in laryngeal mask airway because that's a patent so we just say other equipments and laryngeal mask so it's a kind of second generation laryngeal mask because you can see that there is a tube or place from where you can pass your suction catheterized tube and then through this tube this will enter the esophagus and you can de uh, deflate the stomach so it is actually ideal question number 10 it is used for humidification as a phase to both of the above none of the above this is what this is hme that is heat and moisture exchanger So basically, its main use is for humidification, heat and moisture exchanger. Means how it works. This area, you know, this layer you can see, this is actually hygroscopic layer. So what it will do, whatever the water which is exhaled by the patient breath, so water from expired gas of the patient will be absorbed here and in the next breath the same water will be delivered back. So again in next breath water is absorbed and in the next breath the same water is delivered to the patient. So basically its main aim is to maintain humidification. However, it also acts as a filter and its use really become very very popular during covid scenario that's why actually i have included in questions also because this is also very important because it really become very very popular during covid scenario as a filter so in fact we are using two filters one between endotracheal tube and our anesthesia circuit and one at the end of expiratory limb uh, of the circuit when it is attached to machine so even if some virus bypasses this filter at least it will be absorbed by the second filter so that this covid virus does not enter the machine so our machine remain, remains sterile protected from covid so basically this is heat and moisture exchanger hme which is you know also popularly called as artificial nose and it is used for humidification as well as filter so both of the above Question number 11. All statement about the following equipment. Preferred for children, laryngoscope of choice for infants, can be used for newborn resuscitation, none of the above. Now, which is this laryngoscope blade? This is Miller. The most commonly used, you know, is Macintosh. Which has curved blade but that is mainly preferred for adults for children you know in again i'll use green pen because for children you will see that so many uh, different kind of laryngoscopes were being used like for uh, newborn megale for infants different toddlers different uh, uh, younger children different different laryngoscopes were used but now they had made it very simplified that for children of all ages, even to a newborn or even to a toddler or an adolescent, the blade that you should use is Miller. So now, simply for adults, the blade of choice is Macintosh, while for children of all ages, laryngoscope blade of choice is miller and miller you can see is straight blade largely the little curve at the end 
so largely stay with little curve at the end but don't think that we can't use macintosh for children so can be used for pediatric patients but not preferred similarly don't think that miller cannot be used for adults can be used for adults but definitely preferred for children so now we can look at the choices preferred for children yes for infants yes can be used for newborn gestation yes so none of that all are true statements question number 12 this is done ease of oral intubation ease of nasal intubation both none of the above what is this this you know is mallam patti classification and in fact nowadays we are actually using modified mallam patti classification so this modified mallam patti classification is done to assess the mouth opening so what we do we ask the patient to open mouth as wide as possible by looking at the structure seen patient has been categorized into four categories so modified mallam patti 1 you will be seeing fossil pillars tonsillar pillars you will be seeing fossas fossas means entry to the oropharynx uvula and soft palate so four structures are seen while in original mallam patti fossas was not included so only tonsillar pillars uvula and soft palate so modified mallam patti one all will be seen in two tonsillar pillar will be seen fossas <coughs> will not be seen while uvula still seen if not full then major part and soft palate is seen while in 3 uvula also is not seen or maybe just tip not seen or maybe just tip soft palate is seen while in grade 4 nothing is seen uh, sorry so grade 2 tonsillar pillar will not be seen while fossas will be seen fine so tonsillar pillar not seen fossa pillar not seen but fossas is seen uvula may be seen as a whole or a major part in grade 3 yes uvula only tip is seen and soft palate is seen and grade 4 nothing is seen so in 1 and 2 obviously oral intubation is easy in grade 3 oral intubation is difficult while in grade 4 there is no mouth opening so obviously oral intubation will be impossible so either you have to go for nasal intubation or uh if that's also not feasible then patient may even undergo tracheostomy so this is done to assess the ease in oral intubation 13 this equipment cannot detect methemoglobinemia sulfhemoglobinemia fetal hemoglobin all of the above what is this this is pulse oximeter telling you oxygen saturation and pulse so the one of the major limitation of these pulse oximeters which we are using nowadays that they cannot detect abnormal hemoglobin so even all the modern uh, pulse oximeters also they cannot detect abnormal hemoglobin like if the patient is suffering from methemoglobin self hemoglobin fetal hemoglobin uh they will not be able to detect and they will give you the false values so to detect this abnormal hemoglobins we have to use a special type of oximeters that is called as cooximeters so cooximeters are the special type of oximeters which can detect abnormal hemoglobin so even the latest pulse oximeter cannot detect abnormal hemoglobin so this is pulse oximeter it will not be able to detect any of these the following graph of capnography represents esophageal intubation recovery of spontaneous breath cardiac oscillations bronchospasm in esophageal intubation what will happen to capnography it will be zero when the tube is not in trachea then from where co2 will come out so it will become zero and that is the reason 
that why capnography uh, is considered considered as 100% confirmatory to confirm intubation so in isovasal intubation what you will see there will be co2 and as far as the tube come out there is no co2 the graph becomes flat line the recovery of a spontaneous breath yes this is called as curare noche this is called as curare noche which indicates recovery of a spontaneous breath means the effect of muscle accent has waned off now it is a time to uh, repeat the dose of muscle accent otherwise normal capnograph you know is like this like this so this notch is an indicator that patient is trying to take spontaneous breath in between so that means as i told you the effect of muscle accent has waned off so it is the time to repeat the dose of muscle relaxant cardiac oscillations seen in very lean and thin patients which will be shown as like this like this and bronchospasm increases the uh, expiratory time so the kind of graph that you will see is that expiration is prolonged like this so it's a pattern you can say like shark fin so bronchospasm you will see shark fin pattern so this is recovery of spontaneous breath b blue vaporizer is of sevoflurane desflurane halothin isoflurane vaporizers you know are the uh, equipments which are used for the delivery of volatile agents and they have given color codings for all these vaporizers so sevo the color coding is yellow for desflurane color coding is blue for halothane the color is red and for isoflurane the color described is purple so they have asked blue so this is blue blue is of desflurane b and this is yellow so this is of sevoflurane question number 16 used in obstetric patients dental analgesia both of the above none of the above what is this first antonox and how you identify antonox by the color color of nitrous oxide cylinder is blue and it is a mixture of 50% nitrous oxide and 50% oxygen so blue body and blue quadrant that is indicating nitrous oxide while a white quadrant indicates oxygen so this is antonox and the use of antonox is mainly for painless labor so mainly antonox is used in obstetric patients for painless labor however it can also be used for dental analgesia dentists they are also using antonox so here since the choice is both of the above so we'll go for both of the above but if both of the above is not given then definitely we'll go for obstetric patients obstetric anesthesia untrue agent of choice for induction in pediatric patients convulsions compound a none of the above what is this sevoflurane sevoflurane you know is the agent of choice for induction in pediatric but i like to clarify agent of choice for induction in pediatric and this agent means i'm talking of inhalation agent fine inhalation agent of choice for induction in pediatric patient is sevoflurane why because it has got very smooth induction but don't think that it is the induction agent of choice in pediatric patients as such induction agent of choice whether it is a pediatric or adult patient is always iv propofol but the problem is that the children will not allow us to put iv lines and many of the children they are coming to us without iv cannulas so we induce them by inhalation induction and then we put iv cannulas 
so first choice of induction is always iv but if that is not possible then second choice obviously is we induce a child with inhalation induction and inhalation induction agent of choice is co chlorine second choice if co not available then is halothane again it has got smooth induction isofluorine and desfluorine they have got irritating induction so they cannot be used for induction convulsion cs there has been case reports of convulsion but that is very very rare and that is only seen in pediatric patients where we are using very high concentration for induction so it can produce convulsions but very rarely then yes theoretically by reacting with soda lime it can produce a toxic compound called as compound a which is nephrotoxic but more or less the production of compound a is theoretical but yes it can produce compound a which is a nephrotoxic agent fine so other things about uh, sevoflurane what you can use is that is the inhalational agent of choice for neurosurgery why because it minimally decreases the ict not minimally decrease in fact minimum i will say minimum increase in ict so all inhalation agent they increases ict including sevoflurane then it is also the inhalation agent of choice for hepatic patients because it minimally minimally decreases the hepatic blood flow and for pediatric induction i have already told you disadvantage is it can cause convulsions it can produce theoretically compound a and with a desiccated soda lime it can cause burns of respiratory tract with desiccated soda lime desiccated means extremely dry soda lime so sevoflurane now is really getting very very popular so we went in a little detail of sevoflurane contraindicated in pneumothorax pneumomediastinum pneumopericardium all of them all. this is what nitrous oxide blue cylinder and one of the very important physical property of nitrous oxide is that it is 35 times more soluble than nitrogen so if there is any air space any of air present in any of a closed space like patient is having pneumothorax pneumomediastinum pneumian encephalum pneumopericardium imagine for one mole remove one mole of nitrous oxide removed one mole of nitrogen removed 35 molecules of nitrous oxide will enter and imagine how fast a small pneumothorax can get converted into tension pneumothorax so if there is any air in any of a closed space the use of nitrous oxide is absolutely absolutely contraindicated and in fact can turn out to be a lethal event so all of them are contraindicated in all of the above conditions 19 can reverse all except bicuronium rocuronium atrocuronium pancuronium this is what bridgeon that is suga medex so suga medex is a newer type of uh, reversal agent which directly bind to muscle accent form a complex and that complex get eliminated through the kidney is not indirectly acting like neostigmin which indirectly reverses the effect by increasing the acetylcholine level and that is why this increase acetylcholine has side effects so we have to give a anti muscarinic agent but that is not a issue with sugamedex second advantage its onset is very fast immediate and it can reverse very deep blocks but the disadvantage one it is very very expensive then there is risk of anaphylaxis and thirdly it cannot reverse benzyl isoquinones it can only reverse steroidal kind of compounds so therefore it cannot reverse benzyl isoquinone so obviously cannot reverse atracurium so atracurium is a benzyl isoquinone while other are steroids don't you which of the following structure is not encountered during epidural anesthesia okay so what are the structures which are encountered when you are giving spinal anesthesia this is anterior this is posterior 
so obviously you will be entering from the posterior side so first to encounter is skin and again this is very commonly asked question actually then it is subcutaneous tissue then is the supraspinous ligament supraspinous connecting the tip of spinous processes then is the interspinous connecting the spinous processes then is the ligamentum flavum which you know is also called as yellow ligament of the body then is the dura and almost adhere to the dura is arachnoid so there is no actually subdural space so as soon as you pierce the dura you also pierce the uh, arachnoid so spinal is given here in subarachnoid space while epidural is given here outside the dura outside the dura means between dura and ligamentum flavum so while giving spinal you encounter skin subcutaneous tissue then supraspinous ligament then interspinous then ligamentum flavum then dura and then arachnoid while with epidural skin subcutaneous tissue supraspinous interspinous and ligamentum flavum not dura or arachnoid so that was the question not encountered during epidural supraspinous will be encountered interspinous will be encountered ligamentum flavum will be encountered but you will not be pierced in the dura the most bothersome complication after this procedure horner syndrome fraining nerve palsy pneumothorax laryngeal nerve palsy what is this block this is supraclavicular brachial plexus block brachial plexus can be blocked at four sites interscalene between intermediascal nerve supraclavicular which is most commonly used infraclavicular and at axillary level four level supraclavicular is most often used like here you can see at the midpoint of clavicle you palpate for subclavian artery and then you enter your nerve lateral to the artery keep on going downwards till you elicit the paresthesia now the most bothersome complication of supraclavicular approach is pneumothorax the incidence of which can go as high as 6% but fortunately majority of these pneumothorax are just caused by needle puncture so they are not bothersome the problem is if your block fails and you give ga then you know that your uh, small pneumothorax can become tension pneumothorax because of positive pressure ventilation so the best method to prevent this is the direction of shift needle should always be lateral to artery because you know that the domo pleura is on medial side so if your needle become medial you medial you can easily puncture the pleura so needle should always be lateral so the most bothersome complication i will say is pneumothorax however if they ask you most common then it is phrenic nerve so this is most common so don't most common if they ask you then it is phrenic nerve palsy but if they ask you most bothersome that is pneumothorax because unilateral phrenic nerve is really not a much bothersome complication and to all of the following drugs can be given through the following route except adenaline atropine sodium bicarbonate none of the above which is this route this is intraosseous intraosseous means into the medullary cavity and the most commonly used medullary cavity is tibia otherwise you can use lower end of tibia ulna even sternum any or humerus upper part so any of a superficial bone you can use and a very important changes which has been made in intraosseous route so i'll be using green pen now it can be used for 
all ages. Previously, you know, it was used only for children less than six years of the age, but now intraosseous can be used for all ages, and anything can be given. Anything means you can even give uh, fluids or even blood transfusion through intraosseous route, and thirdly, preferred over endotracheal. So it is even preferred over endotracheal. So this is a, again an important change in intraosseous. So you can expect the question. So now we can look at the question. All of the following drug can be given except adrenaline, atropine, sodium bicarbonate, none of the above. Anything can be given. So none of the above. Twenty-three. A twenty-year-old boy who has CSOM is being posted for tympanoplasty. The agent which should be avoided is helium, nitrous oxide, halothane, isofluorine, nitrous oxide. I, we have already discussed that one of the important property of nitrous oxide is that it is 35 times more soluble than nitrogen. So, patient has undergone tympanoplasties and middle ear also has air. So, ingress of nitrous oxide will increase the middle ear pressure and that will lead to displacement of their graft and failure of surgery. So, for middle ear surgery, we should avoid nitrous oxide. B. Question number 24. All of the following patients can be considered for daycare surgery except 80 year male for IND, 4 year child for circumcision, 45 year female with mild hypertension which is controlled on antihypertensives for DNC for endometrial biopsy, none of the above. Daycare surgery. One thing which really became popular in last 10 15 years is daycare surgery because daycare surgery has many advantages. Patient is discharged same day, so patient compliance is very good. Then uh, patient cost of treatment is reduced. Then nosocomial infection which the patient is going to uh, acquire in hospital, they can be reduced. Then you have more beds available for other sick patients. So that is why daycare surgery has been so drastically induced, uh, drastically increased that you can say that around 10 years back, around 15 to 20% of the surgeries are done on daycare basis in US. Today they are doing more than 60% of the surgeries on daycare basis. So therefore, there are important changes. Now, which all patient group that can be considered for daycare surgery? All ages. Again, I'll use green pen. Because previously, we were not taking patients at the extreme stage. Infants were not taken and old age people or above 70 years were not taken. But now you can nowadays take even a newborn also or even a 100 year patient also all ages only exception is prematures prematures we still don't consider for daycare surgery then patient asa1 too easily and 3 even if the disease is controlled previously we used to say controlled for 3 months but now they say there's no 3 months if you feel the disease is controlled means controlled and patient must be accompanied by attendant. So these are the patient selection criteria for daycare surgery. Surgery selection criteria. Surgery is without any post-op complications. Surgeries which are not associated with any post-op complication and duration around 90 minutes not absolute but around 90 minutes now if you are giving ga you can give regional anesthesia or you can give ga but if you are giving ga then your selection of the agent should be iv agent that you will be using is propofol inhalational agent is sevoflurane although desflurane recovery is faster but desflurane cost, side effect, and uh, the difference in sevoflurane and desflurane recovery is not more than two minutes. So, considering all these factors, now sevoflurane is preferred over desflurane. Then, muscle relaxant, mevacurium, benzodiazepine, midazolam, 
and opioid for daycare surgery is remifentanil. Remifentanil. Question number 25. For the following situation where there is one resuscitation, the compression to ventilation ratio should be 30 is to 2, 15 is to 2, 30 is to 1, 15 is to 2. Now, there are two situations when you are doing CPR. Without advanced airway, or with advanced airway. Without advanced airway means you are ventilating the patient with bag and mask. With advanced airway means you have intubated. Now the patient may be pediatric patient or patient may be adult patient. And you may be a single resuscitator or you may be more than one, two resuscitators. But with advanced airway you will always be more than one resuscitator that is why you are undergoing advanced airway. So for pediatric patient, if you are a single resuscitator, the ratio of compression to ventilation is 30 to 2 and for adults also 30 to 2. 30 to 2 means you will give 30 compressions, go to mouth, give 2 breath, come to chest, give 30 compressions, go to mouth, give 2 breath like that. But if you are two resuscitators, then for pediatric this ratio becomes 15 to 2. While for adults it will always remain 30 to 2 irrespective of the resuscitators. But once the patient is intubated, that means you have achieved the advanced airway, all these ratios finishes. For, for, <coughs> for patients, the compression will be continued at a rate of 100 to 20 per minute for pediatric and adults, while respiratory rate breath for pediatric is 20 to 30 per minute. While for adults it is 10. And again, this is very important change in 2020 AHA CPR guidelines. Previously, for children also, we were keeping a rate of 10 breaths per minute, but now for pediatric age group, they say 20 to 30 breaths per minute. Means one person will continue compression at a rate of 100 to 120 breaths per compressions per minute, and second person, if he is giving breath to adult, then it will, he will give one breath after every 6 seconds, 10 breath. While for children, he will be giving every breath after 2 to 3 seconds, means 20 to 30 per minute. So now our question is, one is succitator and it is adult, so compression ventilation ratio should be 30 to 2. And I think those should be enough. So these are the very important points, obviously they, are, they cannot uh, be complete because anesthesia wide subject and uh, so you have to really you by this time you would have definitely read in details so this is just to give you a very important recent advancement or a important you can say questions hope it will be beneficial and uh, later also if you have any doubt you can post on our facebook and there are telegram groups also you know you can post your queries there and we try to resolve as soon as possible. Thank you very much and my best wishes.